Hello, good day. My name is Victor De Lorenzo, and I am a professor of research in the National Center of Biotechnology in Madrid. And I'm happy to be with you today, sharing some of our ideas and some of our results about our efforts to uh, scale up uh, environmental interventions for the sake of improving um, chemical pollution problems. So let me just um, start by showing the image of where I work, the National Center of Biotech in, uh, in Madrid, outside Madrid. And also, before I forget, I just want to show you the faces of some of my collaborators there. Okay, so to get started, uh, I'll show you these pictures that show something that you know, and it is that urban and industrial activities create uh, a large number of environmental problems because of emissions of toxic chemicals. And uh, you can make a list of uh, the different types of emissions that uh, create a problem, in some cases local problems, in other cases larger problems. And on the top of it is uh, CO2 emissions, but you have many other uh, molecules and products that we release into the environment and uh, cause uh, undesirable consequences. And that includes uh, plastic waste, uh, micropollutants, uh, problems with phosphorus, with nitrogen, um, lignocellulosic residues, particulates, I mean, you name it. So we are all aware that our lifestyle and our uh, industrial activities create all these type of problems. So um, the problems have an impact in the ecosystems, as we all know, but um, let me give you some kind of angle uh, to this general statement. And is that depending on the type of impact, the strategies for remediation might be very, very different. So uh, in the first two cases that you see there, where you have is a situation in which you have a sustainable functioning zone and you may have a regime uh, where you have a linear impact of the um, emission in the environment in such a way that when you uh, stop uh, stressing the environment, you can return easily to the starting point. That's very good. Or you may have a non-linear but still reversible situation, as I have here in what I call regime um, B here and regime A. So that means that, uh, again, when you stop the stress, then you return to something that is acceptable. But then you have these other cases that are very frequent, unfortunately, and more and more frequent. And it's cases where uh, a stress makes the system to move into uh, a kind of critical uh, threshold dependent point, where beyond that, you have a catastrophe. And then uh, that means that you go beyond the tipping point and you run into a regime that might not be reversible at all, even if the cause of the stress assist. So uh, this is something that some experts call environmental dysbiosis. So that means that you affect the uh, equilibria that uh, maintains the functioning of the system uh, to an extent that um, makes uh, the damage irreversible, even if you stop uh, contaminating or releasing emissions. Well, the um, stability uh, of different types of ecosystems, for instance, the soil ecosystems, depend on the interface between different actors. You have a mineral actor, you have a plant actor, you have a micro uh, uh, factor and so on. And uh, at the end, uh, if you stress uh, this consortium of these interactions too much, then you go into this um, non-reversible state, you go beyond the tipping point. And you can, I mean, you, you see these examples in many, many uh, places of the world. So for instance, what you have here is the frontier between Egypt and Israel. And you see how in one side you have something that looks like sustainable in the other side it looks like it has entered an unreversible state of uh, desertification and the same for instance in this uh, border between haiti and the dominican republic so um, there are some actors here that are the ones that will make a difference uh, between going before the tipping point or after the tipping point and in any case uh, if we don't have special interventions and special uh, actions when you go beyond the tipping point the system will not return to the initial situation and this is what we will be discussing today how to handle environmental remediation when the impact that we have on the environment has gone beyond uh, the tipping point well we may have uh, reactive approaches and this is very popular in the last few years uh, you can play with re reducing co2 emissions you can go into a type of energy that uh, uses less carbon, you can go into biofuels, you can Im improve uh, crops, uh, uh, but you know, uh, this would be like reactive, um, uh, say, uh, actions. Can we be proactive? Well, in the last few years, a bunch of uh, scientists are entertaining uh, the concept that 
to uh, do something uh, in situations that go beyond the tipping point is not enough that you yeah, make, make these preventive actions. You really need to have a proactive action on that. And I just show you the faces of some of them. You may see my face uh, there. And what we are proposing is that we have to think big and entertain uh, environmental remediation scenarios that uh, go beyond um, uh, being local and think into uh, applying these uh, agents or these uh, strategies for remediation at a much, much larger scale. So the basis for that is that uh, there are biological agents, either natural or that you can make in the laboratory, that have the ability to really uh, recover the, um, the functioning of ecosystems in the cases where natural situations or nat mother nature cannot do the same job. So in this case, uh, what we can entertain is that you can uh, make a block diagram of the different components that will be necessary to have uh, at play to um, have the ecosystem working well. Then you can identify what will be the material agents for these um, uh, block um, actions to happen. And then you can make an abstraction on ter in, the, in, in terms of logic actions between them. And eventually all, all, is, all it uh, boils down to write a DNA sequence where all the activities and all the interactions are encoded. And this is mostly the job of what formerly was called genetic engineering, and now uh, more and more is called synthetic biology, namely the possibility of programming biological systems and biological agents to a very, very high degree of predictability and uh, efficacy. Who can run this show of massive um, uh, intervention in the environment. Well, there are very serious uh, arguments in favor of uh, making an alliance with microbes and environmental microorganisms, simply because if you look at the breakdown of biomass in the biosphere, you realize that despite the fact that plants are the major players, the major owners of the biomass in the, in the, in the earth crust, it happens that if you just delete one molecule from the whole equation, and it's lignocellulose, then most of the rest of the biomass happens to be microorganisms. And therefore, objectively, microbes and environmental microbes are the uh, natural, the most uh, efficient allies that we may have to really think big in terms of uh, environmental interventions. Uh, well, you can just calculate some numbers, and then you realize that uh, microbes can uh, be scaled up very, very easily. You can go from a test tube to a global scale, and the numbers um, you know, um, indicate that this is a major player in the whole uh, function of the biosphere. So um, by um, doing something with the environmental microbiome, probably we can have a big impact in the whole problem. And also, and this is very important for the later discussion, uh, what happens is that environmental microorganisms propagate their DNA. And therefore, something that one makes at the level of genome can really propagate very quickly at a very high level. So that means that if we are able to create in the laboratory activities that are beneficial for the environment, chances are that they can be propagated at a very large scale using reasonable techniques, as we will discuss a bit later. So um, this raises, of course, a number of questions. Some of them are purely scientific, like you know, how do you engineer the pathways for this um, degradation or bioremediation or environmental improvement? Uh, how you write the DNA uh, to bring about these uh, desirable activities. But what I am going to discuss uh, with you today, because this is an audience interested in risks, is uh, what I call environmental galenics. And galenics is the challenge of uh, putting things that one develops in the laboratory into a wider environment in the context of, uh, say, um, uh, bioremediation. Well, the term galenics, uh, probably many of you know, it comes from other fields. But at the end of the day, it involves how to formulate and how to spread uh, synthetic biology agents or engineer agents at a very large scale. Uh, the concept comes from pharmacy and um, is this a problem or this challenge of how to deliver a medicament to a sick body. So you know that the same medicament can be delivered in the shape of an injection or a pill or a suppository or an aerosol. Well, by the same token, it's not enough that you develop in the laboratory a one a remediating activity. You have to think also on ways of releasing this in a safe and uh, efficacious uh, fashion. And this is exactly what we will be discussing at, uh, at, until the end of the, of, of the discussion. Okay, so uh, what do we want to deliver into the environment? 
Uh, well, uh, you may think on monoclonal uh, agents, uh, that means, for instance, a bacterium that has been modified to degrade this or that, or to fix CO2 or something else. But we can also think on releasing metaorganisms. That means consortia or mixtures of different types of agents in the same pack. But we can also think, and, and uh, this is uh, something that is becoming fashionable in the last few years, to release just DNA and then uh, propagate the DNA uh, in the environmental microbiome and allow this DNA to make its job by getting inserted into the genomes of bacteria and microbes that are already there. And to that end, uh, we have to play with an important concept, that is the concept of chassis, that is the concept, a concept that comes from car engineering and other areas of uh, say, mechanical engineering. So a chassis in, in engineering, as you know, is this idea of having just a basic framework where you have all the necessary components for the car to run. And then on top of that, you may put um, bits and pieces uh, in and out uh, to make the system work optimally. Well, by the same token, you can entertain that uh, you can go to the laboratory and then um, on the basis of the biology that we know, you can identify biological chassis in such a way that you can put in and out different activities that will enrich the capabilities of this uh, bacterium or that or this other uh, biological system for the sake of uh, bioremediation. So what should be in such a chassis, in such a biological chassis? Well, you can make a list of things that are desirable to have in such a platform. Uh, well, obviously it has to be um, efficacious in the target scenario. It has to be stable. It has to be safe. Um, you have to know a lot about the platform itself. It has to be uh, traceable, and we'll return to that later. It has to have a, a defined antigenicity. We have to know a lot about it. So uh, you can make a list of, say, what would be an ideal chassis for this type of environmental applications and for eventual release at large scale. Well, uh, in the literature, you may find uh, a list of, of chassis that industrial and environmental and biotechnology have been entertaining for the last two years. And uh, well, you have from very, very simple uh, bacteria that are used as models all the way to uh, real platforms that are designed and targeted and, and, and thought for delivery at large scale, either a large scale reactor or a large scale environment. And um, uh, well, when you think on, on, on a specific, uh, say, uh, places uh, where this uh, chassis with modifications can operate, uh, you can think in a large number of uh, ecosystems. So not only soil ecosystem, air ecosystem, uh, and other ecosystems, but you know things like uh, the skin, the plant roots, uh, anaerobic situations, aerobic situations, you name it. So for each of these um, scenarios, you can entertain a specific chassis that you go to the laboratory and improve for the sake of making them useful for this type of environmental remediation and environmental applications. And at the end, uh, once we have the chassis with all the uh, additions and all the pathways for environmental uh, improvement, then you have to, again, think big and, um, and, and entertain how can you really go at a high scale. So to that end, um, well, there are various concepts around. The one that I like the most, and this is part of a collaboration with other scientists, in particular, Ricard Soleil, University of Barcelona, is this idea that you have to go little by little, or you can just release your chassis with the different um, uh, modifications immediately. I mean, you have to go little by little and then identify the parameters, the risks, the aspects of the uh, operation that are necessary to go to the next step in the, uh, in the scale up. So you start with genetic models that you develop in the lab, then you can go into more or less synthetic cells, uh, then eventually you go into a mesocosm, and then you go all the way up to a model system, a model scenario that may end up with a ocean terraformation or a large scale uh, interventions for uh, degrading or for reverting the effect of our emissions. So, uh, well, as I said, in practical terms, what happens is that you have to uh, go to the laboratory, make your favorite agent uh, by using uh, advanced genetic uh, techniques, and then monitor their performance first in a small uh, space or in a small model, like a microcosm, and then you have to go little by little. And for instance, you have this uh, installations and facilities in different parts of the world called ecotrons, where you can really control uh, the atmosphere, the soil, the plants, the microbes at a scale that is sufficient to generate um, a parameters for a large, um, say, a scale um, uh, intervention. Okay, immediately, I'm sure that this audience is super sensitive to that. 
this idea of going to the laboratory using the best genetic technologies that we have for um, uh, counteracting environmental um, say emissions and then go big and spreading them at large scale and everything immediately it raises the questions of risks i mean so i, I would like to, to to discuss with you how these risks um, can be handled both from the point of view of safety and the point of view of security and what we have on top of the table to really think along the line well this is an issue that is uh, the matter of some academic research and i have been involved in a, in a number of initiatives on that because at the end um, what you have to uh, say define is what the what, what is the interplay between naturally occurring uh, microorganisms and naturally occurring biological systems and engineer uh, counterparts so uh, well you can make a, a scheme of how you go between natural to synthetic you can start with bacteria or microbes that are natural isolates, no problem, or you can start in the process of making them more and more modified from a genetic point of view. So you can make some random mutants, or you can make some um, directed mutations, or you can generate genetic variants, and so on and so on. And at the end, uh, we're not there yet, but eventually we may have completely synthetic agents, even with completely uh, different genomes. We're not there yet. I would say that right now we are between five and six, and maybe with the time we will be able to get to eight, but you know, for the time being, we have to play with um, microbes and agents that we make in the laboratory that has that have still a good deal of natural properties, natural genes, but where we have introduced also genes that have been improved in the laboratory for various purposes. So what are the questions that one has to raise in connection to these uh, agents? Uh, well, I have a list of them. I can go one by one. I'm sure that uh, many of you will recognize um, uh, core uh, questions and challenges that one has to face for diagnosing uh, risks associated to uh, this type of applications. So can these agents colonize um, and take over natural communities? Can they enter new niches? Can they go into a stage of uncontrolled growth? Can we, um, will they trigger allergies that we don't know? A, a very important, it will be able to transfer their recombinant DNA or their manipulated DNA. Well, can we live with some trade-off between safety and uh, biotechnological efficacy? Uh, can, they, uh, can the traits evolve into something undesirable like virulence or other deleterious behavior? Are there scenarios where they may damage property and, and, and life? And um, what is the environmental fate of, of synthetic genes? Are there chances, very, very important from the point of view of biosecurity, of malicious misuse? Should they be endowed with traits to increase their safety and predictability? These are all completely legitimate questions. Um, but you know, at the end, uh, these questions boil down to agencies that have to give a stamp for application of these um, uh, say agents uh, at different scales and they have to put a stamp that they are safe enough for uh, release or for uh, large scale applications and that means that they have to go through uh, various agencies and through various tests and come up with a kind of certification for use. So in Europe, uh, the agency that makes this certification is the European uh, Food Safety Authority, EFSA, and the most desirable stamp for this type of agents is the stamp uh, QP, QPS, that means Qualified Presumption of Safety. That is equivalent to what in the uh, FDA is known as GRAS or generally regarded as safe. Okay, so once you uh, go through uh, their uh, analysis and their appraisal, then you get this stamp and then we are in business and we can think on uh, delivering um, and using these agents at large scale. And in fact, EFSA has recently put together a very interesting report on uh, the evaluation of uh, risk assessment associated to these super, super engineer um, microbes and agents uh, under the umbrella of uh, synthetic biology. So this is an interesting document that you are very welcome to, to take a look to because it gives you some guidelines on uh, how to distinguish what is um, a standard GMO and, and uh, recombinant bacteria and things that are super engineered uh, with the stamp or with the technical approach of synthetic biology. But one very, very important aspect of all this uh, discussion 
is that of containment. So from the very early beginning of the history of biotechnology and the history of, of modern biotechnology and recombinant DNA, there's this question of whether, given the uncertainties uh, about the behavior of this uh, type of uh, recombinant agents, we should contain them in such a way that uh, they can depart from time and space uh, from the scenario that they are expected to perform. So there are dozens and dozens of propositions of how to genetically engineer conditional suicide systems or um, uh, genetic firewalls to make sure that the bacteria and the microbes that we engineer in the lab do not depart from the conditions that we are interested. However, uh, the experience of the last 20 years is that none of these containment systems work 100%. So there's no certainty of containment. They may work 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 9. And at this point, the best conditional uh, containment system is one that achieves a containment in the range of 10 to the minus 11. But still, you have many more bacteria in the environment. And eventually, risks are that at some point, one of the microbes will mutate and will depart whatever uh, barrier you put to prevent their dispersion. So what can you do? Okay, so I want to share with you um, some ideas that we and others are entertaining to, uh, to, to, to handle and, and, to, and to manage the risk associated to put into the environment agents that we produce in the laboratory. So given that you cannot contain uh, these uh, agents in, the, in, the, in, in a given condition because of what I just mentioned, what if instead of that we take inspiration from other fields? And if you have pets, uh, you know that in many cases, they can be microchipped. And in this case, what happens is that your favorite uh, pet is stuck with a unique identifier. And if the um, dog uh, gets lost or it beats someone or it uh, generates rabies or whatever, immediately you can go to the chip and get all the information about the dog and do whatever you have to do uh, to counteract the problem. So uh, by the same token, uh, we have been entertaining in collaboration with our friends and colleagues in Newcastle, Natalio Krasnogor, the idea of barcoding uh, our, our, our the, well, ours or yours um, uh, synthetic biology uh, chassis or constructs in such a way that once you have a unique identifier in your barcode, you may not be able to contain um, your favorite uh, um, bacterium in a given uh, scenario. However, by identifying this barcode, then you can immediately know what the species you have, what strain you have, what is the uh, ownership status and the intellectual property status, the genotype, the phenotype. I mean, you can know everything about um, uh, this specific bacterium that you put into the environment because you have this unique identifier. So um, uh, at the end, what you need to do is to um, um, come up with a sequence that is absolutely unique. And this is uh, something that is not easy. Uh, you have to resort to advanced computation and to identify uh, sequences that are alien or are, in the jargon of synthetic biology, orthogonal to all known uh, biological sequences and use that as the basis to put unique identifiers in the genomes of different bacteria and different microbes. And uh, at the end, what you want to have is a stable insertion of that sequence in the genome of your uh, target bacterium, and then make sure that it remains there forever, and therefore it can be retrieved and uh, used as a barcode for uh, your construct. Okay, well, um, this is something that we have been doing in collaboration with uh, Newcastle, and um, it allows not only to have a stamp a barcode in the last product, but also to monitor all the intermediates step in their construction. So I just direct you to this work by um, Telea and Luzardo et al. in Newcastle in collaboration with us. And then um, what they were um, proposing and developing as a kind of case study was precisely to have a series of strains uh, that you could monitor uh, their pedigree and their origin and their uh, um, all the characteristics of this strain by barcoding each of the stages in the production of a final um, strain. So uh, to do that, you need to first write a barcode and uh, well, you do it in a computer. And then uh, at the end, uh, what you do is that you find in your favorite uh, bacterium here or gist or fungi or plant or whatever, um, a good place in the genome that you know is stable and can remain there for some time. 
and then um, you generate the barcode, and then through various genetic techniques, then you, uh, including CRISPR and other advanced genetic tools, then uh, you put it into a stable location of the chromosome, and then here you go, you have your strain barcoded, and then you can use it, and in the case it escapes, uh, you can, uh, or it goes where you don't want, then you can identify very quickly. Well, this is just a slide showing you that we have developed in our laboratory a super uh, a universal system for tagging and for barcoding uh, different uh, types of bacteria, not only bacteria, but also yeasts and other types of biological systems based on um, target runs. And this is, I will just mention the name, I will not give you the details, but just to make sure at this point that we have the technology to barcode anything live, you know, and this is something that can facilitate tremendously the trace traceability and the possibilities of uh, using bacteria for environmental and industrial applications. So uh, if you are interested to read the barcode, all you have to do is to amplify uh, the region that is, of course, uh, known, and then read the code. And then immediately, uh, uh, through a web interface, you are taken to a digital twin. That means that you have in a computer all the information about that strain. And this is wonderful because by doing that, you have you know, basically all the tools that you need to track where the um, cells are, but also in case of danger or in case of travel, you can also go and identify counter um, measures to prevent dispersion or other, say, uh, activities that you may want to apply to prevent um, uh, to cause any damage. Well, this is very unlikely, but uh, you know. So the argument at the end boils down uh, to the idea that by having this barcoding, uh, we have a, a good way of managing risks because we know exactly at every point where the different strains are without having to make this sexy and in, to a large state, to a large state, non-efficacious um, uh, circuits for conditional suicide and containment. So by using this barcoding, this standardization, then we argue that risks can be handled in a much, much better way. So uh, because uh, you have chassis that are barcoded and can be certified and run through all these uh, different tests for uh, different degrees of risk. And then all you have to do at every point is to make a separate uh, risk assessment of the implant, of the genetic implant or the activity implant that you have in this chassis. Whereas if you use just um, chassis that are not certified, are not uh, barcoded or anything, then you have to start every time uh, to identify um, a risk associated to the whole thing. So by uh, adopting this kind of standardization and barcoding, we argue that we can simplify tremendously the, uh, the, the, all the operations that are connected to risk assessment and the appraisal of this stamp for um, approval. And that's very good. So um, in summary, I just want to uh, recap what I just said, um, is saying that, um, and I kind of hammer with that, that barcoding bacteria for environmental release will be ultimately more useful and more realistic than just trying, that, than just trying to contain a bacteria that eventually, sooner or later, will escape this containment that we impose on them. So let me finish my, my little um, discussion with you today by sharing with you this idea that uh, one of the problems or one of the challenges that we have in the application of advanced genetic techniques for environmental release is the fact that so far to this day, we had not one single accident um, from which we could learn from. And, and this is something that's completely different of other areas of technology in which uh, uh, safety is improved as long as we have accidents that we can learn from. So in this scheme here that you may have seen in other, in other um, say context, uh, it's just a calculation that, um, and a prediction that the more accidents that you have in cars, the safest the next generation of cars are. So that means that at the beginning, cars were uh, completely, say, unpredictable. And then uh, only by having accident after accident after accident, then at the end now, the cars that we have today are super, super safe because we have learned basically of everything that can go wrong. So in fact, this is interesting as an example because in the history of um, automobiles, then uh, the first automobiles that were uh, entertained had uh, no or very few safety aspects that now we take for granted. And by that time, uh, you know, uh, they weren't considered as anything important. Uh, 
Um, and for instance, in this first um, vehicle that was developed in the 18th century, no one thought that you needed a wood brake. And then uh, the first prototype uh, crashed into a wall, and it was the first um, car accident. And also, uh, the first fatal car accident was connected to the fact that by that time the cars didn't have brakes. And you know, now you cannot think of a car without a, 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 a braking system. Uh, but by that time, you know, it just the automobiles were uh, were um, led to stop little by little. So obviously, in the moment that there was necessity to stop uh, abruptly or something, then the car ran into big problems. So uh, and also the Titanic case, you know, uh, one of the problems that the number of places in this um, safe uh, in this life saving boats was less than the number of passengers that were accommodated. Then since then, thanks to this accident, then is a law and a regulation that the number of, um, of, of seats in a boat that you need have to be equal to the number of passengers. So uh, one learns from accidents. And uh, biology uh, cannot learn from accidents because we didn't have many accidents. So the alternative for that, and this is again something that we're trying to promote in our own laboratories, uh, our laboratory and other laboratories, is to really uh, try to model and to simulate in our, um, in our working places as many as possible um, environmental scenarios and see how these agents that we prepare in the laboratory behave under these um, uh, circumstances. So for instance, there's a case where you can um, uh, set up a micro environment in droplets in a line. So you can have in a single spray, you can have thousands and thousands of different environmental conditions. And by doing that, and by monitoring the performance of these uh, micros under such variety of conditions, we may figure out, we can generate data that will really allow us to predict and to model and to plan on these larger scale interventions. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I think that this is the end of what I wanted to, to share with you. I just want to uh, leave you with a message that uh, in, in the future, uh, we may have to really apply all these advanced technologies to tackle uh, environmental problems that go beyond the, the, the tipping points um, of, of emissions and that uh, no one should be afraid of that because we have the tools also uh, to monitor the efficacy and the dispersion of these uh, um, um, say microbes or biological agents. And probably uh, this is one of the very, very few alternatives that we have to have eventually an impact and to revert the effects of our uh, insults to the environment up to this point. Well, thank you so much uh, for your attention, and it will be a pleasure to answer your questions after uh, you um, after I'm done and, and you have the opportunity to uh, to interact with the web interface. Thank you very much, and keep in touch. Bye.